Hello and welcome to the world today. My guest in the studio is Professor Kostas Lapavitsas from the School of Oriental and African Studies. But more importantly than that, he has been a member of the Greek Parliament over this last period for Syriza uh, and then walked out of the party together with many others um, after the great capitulation by Cyprus to the European Union. So uh, Kostas is an extremely well-known activist from that point of view in Greece and the rest of Europe. He has written a number of books, is working on another one. So Kostas, thanks very much uh, for being with us. Let's move straight away uh, to Greece. The situation, according to all my friends, acquaintances, is that this is the most depressing time they can remember in the country. Because they say that in the past when things were bad, there was some hope. And at the present time, it seems that hope itself has disappeared because of the great capitulation of Syriza. One has to be careful about these things. There is no question that um, the betrayal by Tsipras and his group in the leadership of Syriza essentially killed hope. These people were elected on the ticket of hope is coming, and they killed it off, basically, because uh, they capitulated. For a long time after the capitulation and after that second election in September 2015, um, people were despondent, um, dazed. Uh, it was like someone hit, hit the nation over the head with something very big and heavy. But I'm glad to report that um, recently uh, things are picking up. And the reason, I think, is fairly clear. Until May 2016, despite the capitulation, despite the obvious betrayal of everything and all the things I had promised, they hadn't actually taken any measures that had directly affected the income and the conditions of life of uh, working people and pensioners and so on. They haven't actually done any of that. Since May this year, they have been taking action. They've reduced um, pensions, they've increased taxes, they've done things that have directly affected people. This seems to have changed the climate. Um, it's become apparent that um, not only did they lie, um, they're also acting like the others. So that seems to have been generating anger now anger and a willingness to do things. It's a very recent uh, development, this. It's manifest, um, and that gives hope again. How do you now, um, Costas, I mean, your own position was pretty clear, but the reports one used to get, and what many Greek people told me, is that they wanted to reject the memorandum which was being imposed, that became obvious, and that was obvious with the referendum. But that many people who wanted to reject the memorandum imposed by the EU on Greece were at the same time divided on whether to leave the currency, the euro, exit from the euro as well. No one was proposing exiting from the EU, but what was being proposed was exiting from the euro uh, zone, which for many of us watching it from a distance appeared to be the most rational thing to do. This is such a complex thing and it has run for such a long time. Let me first of all point out that exiting the monetary union would immediately create a different set of relations with the European Union. There's no doubt at all about it. And to those of us who have been developing this position for years, it was perfectly obvious that just changing the monetary regime uh, that applied to the country would not be sufficient to restore a, a modicum of economic health. We would have to take other steps that would come into direct contradiction with the practices of the European Union when it comes to investment and so on. So we knew that we would be opening up 
a new chapter in uh, relations that might even involve exiting the European Union. I, I myself have said, have said openly many times, if the Greek people want to leave the European Union too, they can do so. And that, that would open up with a monetary union. But the pressing thing was the monetary union, no question. They, uh, because obviously, the monetary union means access to liquidity or no access to liquidity. And without liquidity, in other words, being able to finance banks and finance the payments of the state, you can do nothing. You're actually blackmailed immediately. People didn't understand that. For a long time, people didn't understand it. Monetary questions are complex, and a lot of people on the left, activists and others, just didn't grasp what this meant. And they thought that they could bypass it or find some magical way around it. They didn't understand how telling that power is that uh, the European Central Bank wields. Um, so that was one element. The other thing that was very important was the steady uh, propaganda coming out from the circles of power in Greece, and they were relentless with the most incredible stories about what would happen if the country left the monetary union. Fire and brimstone, the plague, I mean, almost literally, this is what people were coming up with. <clears throat> this had an effect. The last thing on the left is that much of the same nonsense, essentially, was coming out of the left itself, was coming out of people who were desperately committed to this notion of Europe as uh, uh, this great good that, uh, that uh, surpasses, goes beyond the nation state, and therefore it's a good thing by definition, and therefore we must defend it, and therefore we must not exit the monetary union. If we did, disaster would follow. The combination was deadly, deadly. Um, I must, though, acknowledge one thing here, because I argued for exit systematically, and it's very important to grasp that. For exit to have worked, it would have been necessary, or for exit still to work, because I think that's what we need, it would be necessary to have a good group of uh, people who understand what is necessary mm. and to put it in place. And it would also be necessary to have certain elements of the state machine that would be not corrupt, not compromised, that would be able to deliver the policy that you need. And you need to act quickly, coherently, and in an organized fashion. And the Greek state machine is deeply problematic. Mm. And finding these people, the, the group of people in Greece, is not easy. Uh, that was indeed uh, a real problem. They should have taken action to resolve it in advance. They never did anything. Syriza never did anything uh, in this department. What was behind Schubler's offer of I can't remember how much he offered or whether he named a figure where he said we can have an amicable exit from the Eurozone and we will even give you so much money to make sure that there's no disaster. And why was that refused? We don't know of any official offers. It hasn't been acknowledged officially. We do know from what the Greek side has said of two instances, one of which preceded the Syriza government in 2011, it appears Schäuble made an offer to the then government uh, of PASOK for some kind of amicable exit. And that was not even considered. At least that's what ex-ministers, powerful ministers of PASOK uh, themselves publicly acknowledging. Um, and then we also know of an instance, presumably in 2015, in the course of negotiations between Syriza and the lenders, that Schäuble made another offer. And there is a document that circulated, but it's a leak by a journalist. So we don't really know uh, what it's actually It's not happened. an official leak. Yeah. It's, and it's just one page. Uh, I was actually an MP when that uh, was circulated. And that basically says to the Greek government, that document, you've got two choices, both coming from Schäuble, presumably. The first option is apply 
the bailout conditions, a new memorandum, and do exactly what we're telling you. And then we will give you some more money, and you will continue along the lines of... Before. Before. The other option is to exit for a period, and we will give you some of money to ease the, pain. the transition. Yeah. I actually asked uh, the gathering of uh, the parliamentary group of citizens, we had a meeting just before the, um, the final surrender, and I actually took to the podium and asked, what was this other option? Because it wasn't discussed <laughs> at all in that gathering. They went for the first option. I said, what exactly was offered by Schäuble? Uh, can you please tell us what was the nature of his, because from that document, you couldn't tell exactly what the man had in mind. What exactly was offered? And he was like, I had a few swear words in church. I mean, they were up in arms that this was uh, not, we're, we're not gonna do that. This is a terrible offer. This is Schäuble's solution, as if the first one was not Schäuble's solution, you know. Um, and they, I was basically attacked and, and uh, rubbished in the, in, in, in the media and so on. They didn't even want to consider the second option. They went for Schäuble's first option and they applied it. And they presented that, and this is the, the comical aspect of things, they presented that as a great act of resistance because really, truly, Schäuble wanted the second option. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <coughs> Quite why Schäuble would uh, do that is not clear because we don't know what he offered, but I think it has to do with the internal politics of the German elite um, and how it sees the uh, situation. In, in my judgment, the German elite is torn between kicking the Greeks out yeah. and saving themselves the trouble of dealing with this permanent source of trouble, hmm. or browbeating the Greeks enough to ensure that they comply with whatever uh, demands come from the top. And if the Greeks de comply with these demands, then let the Greeks deal with their own country and let them sink or let, let, let anything happen to that country. It's not our problem. It's not our problem. I think that's how the German elite, elite uh, the German ruling bloc sees it. And the Greek um, power brokers have gone for the latter. Costas, coming on now from Greece to the next logical question, which is the European Union. This even before Greece, but of course Greece highlighted it, it's been in a crisis. After 2008, it basically did nothing to change the economic status quo, not even in a moderate way, not even offering some social democratic reforms. They said we'll carry on as before, and we've seen the results, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland. Now, I'm told by people in Germany that within the German elite, there's a very serious discussion taking place, and that the hardline position is within this discussion that this form of the European Union can't continue indefinitely. It's going to crack at some stage. Better to take some initiatives to restructure this union so we have a small core of European countries and the others are given some status to protect ourselves. So what, in your opinion, is this elite the German elite principally, because that's the most important country, especially with Brexit now, they are the dominant country in the EU going to do. I think one key element here is, of course, the monetary union, which is now at the core of the European Union itself. That has clearly failed, and it's dysfunctional. So whatever happens to the European Union is very closely uh, bound up with what happens to the monetary union. Now, from the perspective of the German power brokers, the elite there, the situation is mixed and difficult. Both the monetary union and the European Union as a whole have worked to the advantage of some sections of German capital, <clears throat> but it's, it's contradictory there too. The reason why Germany has emerged as uh, so dominant in the Union, in the monetary union, is fundamentally because it has suppressed 
uh, wages domestically and suppressed its own domestic demand. It's a most peculiar thing. It's not its power of productivity or its prowess in uh, production or anything like that. It's, people have got a, the wrong idea of what's been happening in Germany. It's a country with weak investment, weak productivity growth and so on. And, and, and a, a frozen, effectively frozen domestic economy. Germany has gone on a drive uh, to export. It's a kind of neo-mercantilism. Mm. Wealth comes from abroad. Success comes from abroad. German exporters then love that. And the reason why they've succeeded is first because wages have been kept down, therefore giving German exporters a competitive advantage in the European uh, Monetary Union. And second, the weakness of the euro internationally, which again has to do with the monetary union. <laughs> Um, if it wasn't for these two elements, mm. the ability of Germany to export would have been far, far less uh, than it has been. Germany has made a step change in its exports. So exporters have done very well, and they wanted to continue. But the domestic economy is not doing terribly well, and banks are not doing terribly well. The reason why banks are not doing terribly well is because the domestic economy is going nowhere. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. On top of that, the German power brokers know that their own success in terms of exports and so on has been at the cost of peripheral countries in the, um, in the monetary union and the European Union and increasingly at the cost of France and Italy. Mm. What began as a crisis for the periphery is now gradually becoming a crisis for the core. Similar problem, France and Italy cannot compete with Germany in the, in the monetary union. They're dropping behind. Germany, the power brokers, have begun to realize, I'm sure, how do you deal with it? It's a very complex thing. They made a terrible mistake with the monetary union. They should never have started exactly. that. But they're there. They're trapped in that, and their exporters want it. They can see no other way, because any, other, any change of the status quo will probably mean that the new German currency will go through the roof, and that will hit German exports, which is the only thing that's doing well in Germany. It's very difficult, very difficult indeed. And to be honest, I don't think they'll be able to handle it, to, to handle it um, in, a, in a peaceful and manageable way. I think it will be violent. I think it will be um, a situation of breakup uh, that would have major repercussions for Germany and for the rest. What will emerge out of it is hard to tell, but the best that they can hope for in Germany is a new smaller group of countries around them, uh, countries which are already closely bound up with Germany. That doesn't necessarily involve a new currency or a, a common currency. The Czech Republic is very closely bound up with Germany, still has its own currency. Uh, so what form that new group will take, we will have to wait difficult to see. Difficult to it's say. Very difficult. The, the talk one hears is that apart from uh, Germany, France, some of the Eastern Europeans in Scandinavia, there's nothing else. But France cannot live with Germany either. That's no. the key problem. The key problem with the, of the European Union now is that France, France. France cannot live with Germany. Italy cannot live with Germany. Hmm. These are the real problems. If you look at Italy and its performance, Italy has had practically no productivity growth for 15 years. The Italian economy is in the doldrums. It doesn't work. Um, and uh, poverty, serious poverty, I believe, has re-emerged in the South, uh, in Italy. The South was never particularly well off in no. Italy. But now people tell me that serious poverty is, is, is re-emerging, and it's not surprising if there's been no growth for 15 years worth talking about. The same with France. France is a little bit better than uh, mm. Italy in that respect, but it cannot live with Germany. Uh, mm. the, the competitiveness gap is, is, continues to um, open up as long as Germany continues with... Um, current domestic policies. So, Looking at the responses politically, I mean, in Italy, the political system is in a crisis, as we know. Uh, in France, the far right has grown considerably, and not just in terms of opinion polls, but there was something quite astonishing. Someone asked Marine Le Pen, the leader of the far right in France, You've been very quiet of late. We haven't heard too much of, 
mule. She said, why should I speak when all the others are coming in my direction? Everybody else is doing the, the work for me. Exactly. <laughs> so it's, <clears throat> if the situation, and even in Germany, as we know, the, uh, AfD, yeah. the, the far right group or the extreme right group has done much better than the left party recently. So this is the worry that this crisis is creating possibilities for alternatives from the left, but effectively it's the right that is moving forward and it's the Trump phenomenon in the United States as well to a certain extent. With the increase of the far right groups, which offer, according to people, some solutions, and in fact those solutions we know uh, are, are flippant, not serious, nationalistic. And here it's difficult to offer a left alternative because the one left alternative that we had and which people from all over Europe were looking at was Greece. Here's a left social democratic government being elected. It'll do something which could then be a model for the rest of Europe. That's now gone. The European left, and let's generalize a little bit here, uh, from my perspective has gone on what might be called a long sleep for uh, two, three decades. It really, the bulk of it really genuinely believed that, uh, you know, after the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, uh, Europe is the new uh, frontier of uh, uh, solidarity and uh, the prospect of transcending again the nation state and all this. Uh, these ideas were uh, pernicious mistaken, but very, very influential. One good thing out of the disasters of the last few years is that this has begun to be challenged. And if there is something that's positive out of the series uh, debacle, is that, yeah, this, is, this idea has received a big shock, a big knock. People saw that that's not how Europe works. Um, and if you want to have uh, social change in favor of uh, working people and the poor, you need to confront Europe as well. Um, that I can see happening across Europe now. So I am actually heartened by that. Yes, Syriza failed. The right seem to be benefiting from what's happening, but there is also new life uh, on the left. So that's a good thing uh, as far as I'm concerned. That goes with the second vital thing of the last year, which is, of course, Brexit. Mm. Brexit, indeed, has been led by the right, and the right are the main beneficiaries uh, so far of what has happened. But, come on, look at it. It's, uh, it's actually shown so many things that are so useful to the left. It's shown that the EU project is reversible. It's shown that... Uh, the world will not come to an end if you uh, took certain uh, action. And it all, it's also shown that the ideas of democracy and sovereignty have got deep popular rooting. Um, the left had forgotten about that. Okay? These are very important developments from Brexit, and the left will benefit from those. I have no doubt, uh, I mean the European left, in the fullness of time. When you look at Greece, which is you know, the epicenter of the, the betrayal, even there is interesting. What the polls are showing in Greece is actually people, especially people younger than, f the, than 50 and 40, withdrawing from politics. Hmm. Uh, to, to blazes with both of you. Hmm. We want nothing to do with this political system uh, that promised us so much with Syriza and didn't deliver. You're all the same. We want nothing to do with all this. Yeah, but that's a natural terrain for the left as well. These people are, are a natural electoral ground for the left if the left can find the proposals, the program that would answer the needs of these people today instead mm. of uh, going back to old ideas and ideas that make no sense. Mm. So it's not, it's not by any stretch of the imagination um, situation of despondency yeah. uh, for the left. Far from it. In fact, from my perspective, 2015, 2016, 
probably will be seen as the years of the, 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 the genuine, radical, um, earth-shaking left in Europe was reborn. What is your impression, uh, Costa, since you uh, live and work here part of the time, that's now that you're no longer a member of parliament in Greece, of this sort of social uprising which has projected Jeremy Corbyn to power. That is part of what you're saying, effectively. And the Corbyn's program, which is, you know, quite minimalist on some levels, but on demands such as no privatization of the health service, renationalize the railways, he has majority support in the country. It's one of the most um, encouraging things that uh, we have seen uh, across the world, compared with, I mean, together with what happened in the United States with uh, Sanders. I mean, it's not the same thing, but it itself indicates yeah. interesting developments. Incidentally, it's interesting to note that it's actually a previous generation that's coming up. No, this is very interesting. <laughs> with, these, yeah. with these proposals, and they are attracting the young. young. So it's not as if you need younger politicians to attract the young. Actually, sometimes all the politicians, if they come up with ideas yes. that connect with reality, are perfectly acceptable to, um, to the young, and this is happening in this country too, in Britain. Um, I think Corbyn is, uh, and, and everything that's happened around him is a very positive thing. Um, I've been in this country a long time, right? And I remember well the days when the left outside the Labour Party used to say the Labour Party is finished, and, <laughs> and, uh, and now is uh, from now on, you know, uh, the, it'll be the days of the extra parliamentary left and so on. This has all shown to be yeah. unfounded, basically. Uh, the Labour Party has come back, it's acquired a new left within it. It's not like the old left. Old left, no. It's a new left. This opens up new prospects. It's, it's a work in progress. I, I, I progress. Uh, it, it's very clearly <coughs> that. Um, well, th they had no, I mean, the choice they faced was this. They had totally collapsed in Scotland, Labour. Traditional party of Scotland nothing. collapsed. And yeah. the same would have happened here this is what the labor right doesn't understand. If Corbyn and his team hadn't succeeded, I mean, in winning over the Labour Party, the same thing would have happened here. I think that's the direction in which they've gone. Corbyn, who's been living inside this sort of corpse for many, many years, suddenly started wriggling and the corpse came to life again. And it's now got half a million members. It's the largest party in Europe, left or right. It's a, I mean, historically, it's a unique moment. Yeah. Britain has always been one of the weakest areas of social democracy politically it, in Completely, Europe. And yeah. now it's, it's actually at the forefront. <laughs> now it's at the forefront. And he has a party that uh, is self-consciously social democratic in terms of its program, maybe not as radical as it should be and so on, but it is nonetheless social democratic. And it actually calls itself socialist. He has the guts to call itself socialist and people respond well to it. I mean, the metropolitan elite in London and others might say this is old fashioned and so on. Come on, I mean, Sanders called himself socialist at uh, times and, he worked. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. he worked with the state. I mean, and he wouldn't work in this country, I don't believe it. So, so. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's exactly as, as you just said. I mean, uh, I would never have expected it two years ago. No. Um, there was definitely something happening on the ground. We, you could sense it, but I couldn't tell which way it was going to go. Corbyn must be credited with this, and all the people around him, Momentum and so on, for generating this. They've offered a huge service to the Labour Party. They've rescued it, it's true. The, the elite that ran it had no idea no, no program, nothing, and no appeal to the British people. Uh, and Corbyn is also offering a service to, to, to the country as well. It isn't just the Labour Party. No, because exactly. Because Britain needs new ideas, new proposals, a new program. Uh, uh, okay, it's work in progress, as we said. Uh, but we shall see. We should see, you know. Costas, on that note, thank you very much for joining us today, and we will carry on this discussion. Thank you very thank much. You. It was a pleasure.